doing some basic learning in a variety of different languages and understanding what these different things are is going to make you uh, a more well-rounded technologist anyway. Welcome to the LabVIEW experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. So I am here today with James McNally. Uh, James is over in the UK. Uh, and if you've been around the lobby community for a while, you've probably heard of him. He's done a lot of cool stuff. Uh, he's involved in uh, GDEFCon. He does the GCLI and probably a lot of other things that I have neglecting to mention here. And uh, I think he runs some of the user groups and things. And uh, he's also giving lots of presentations on process stuff around uh, CI, CD, and unit testing and those type of things. So welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, so I, I think you're probably best known uh, for your presentations because you, you do give a lot of presentations. But aside from that, I think you're probably best known for uh, GCLI. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that and like what sparked that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it came from a place like I was interested in, in I've been interested in CI for quite a while. Um, as much as anything, it kind of started out as one of those things of, oh, this is cool. I don't know if I've got a use for it, but can I do it with LabVIEW? And um, hey, uh, can I slow you down though? Can you explain CI just for like? Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, like we throw on these acronyms and you and I both know what it means and some of our listeners do, but there's probably some that don't. Yeah, so by, by CI, uh, it, it stands for continuous integration. And for me, what that primarily means is it's about being able to automate the process of testing, building, and, and perhaps deploying or packaging your software. Um, really comes to, um, you know, where the idea of merging pieces together and making sure it still builds. Yep. Um, but really it's a constant checking of what's going on and it can lead into, you know, continuous delivery where it's actually, we want to always end up with something that we could send to a customer at the end of that. Um, so it's an automation thing and, and. You know, I got, I, I'm really interested in that side of things because, you know, on the one hand, you can see for big companies and lots of people, you need that. I mean, you can't have everybody building on their own system and everybody's system is different and well, I built my PC, but not on your PC. You know, you need to have a way to kind of standardize that process. Um, but I also think that actually for smaller developers, you know, like us, so I work by myself as a consultant. Um, Automation could and should be like a superpower, right? <laughs> it's like, um, man, I can save myself a lot of time. I, I uh, The thing that really triggered it for me was the amount of times that I spent, well, all right, I've finished this. I need to build this for the customer. So I start building executable. has taken a bit, right? I'll go check my emails. End up getting distracted for 15 minutes. Come back. Okay, now I've got to build the installer. Well, this is going to take even longer. It ended up being like an hour process, even though, LabVIEW wasn't taking an hour. When you when you walk away, sometimes like then a dialogue box pops up like right after you walk away. Like that always happens to me like with oh, yeah. installs or VPM installs. There's always like this like, do you want to accept the you want? I'm like, yes, of course I do. Like I don't know. <laughs> the amount of times when I used to be at NI that I would think, right, I'm gonna set an FPGA build going overnight, come back in the morning to the like initial dialogue of do you want to build this here on the server? Like, oh god, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I think continuous integration is one of those things that people think it's for these big teams, but I think everybody benefits from it, even like solo developers. Because I mean, for me, it's all just about getting really fast feedback because then I'm still like thinking about what I'm doing and it's much easier to fix stuff and easier to debug and less stuff to chase down. So that's really- That's it, yeah. I think it's that. There's also like a mentality thing with it, I find, you know, it, it's- you just start to work in ways that are more reliable because it annoys you when it goes wrong and it's obvious when it goes wrong, but, which I guess comes back to feedback as well, right? But I've had good comments back from customers, like when I say, oh yeah, okay, you know, we'll be working on this for two weeks, but you know, I can, I mean, I normally don't quite do it every day, but it's like every few days I can just give you a build or whenever you're ready to test it, I can give you a build and you yep. can test it. And there are, you know, that, that that's had good feedback and, and that's, yeah, a superpower because again, it's feedback. 
the yeah. developer, but then that becomes feedback from the customer rather than waiting for it to all be finished and then have a load of rework uh, to do. Yeah, it's really awesome. Like when you have it set up, right? Because like I have mine set up where like I can literally like change a VI, commit it, and just like tag it and push the tag and get. And I walk away, and I've got like a whole delivery pipeline that they just show up and when they reboot the software, it says, "Hey, there's a new version." I'm like, I oh, that's cool. Yeah. But the the problem with that is, it's a really it's a lot of overhead to set all that up, and so there's a yeah. lot of moving pieces and stuff, and so it's really hard for I think solo developers to justify that for like a single small project. Like, I feel like once you have it set up, then adding a new project is pretty easy. But yeah, yeah that that's been my challenge, and certain aspects of it, it's harder to justify that up for an investment. You know. If you were working on one project for an entire year, then it's easy to justify, well, a few days up front to do that. But like you say, you know, as a solo developer, you can't afford that on every project. So, you know, I have a basic setup, which is, um, you know, it's not formally templated. It's more of a copy and paste kind of template that goes into every project. And I've got the build service set up to do that. Um, once a year, which actually reminds me, it's going to come around any time now. <laughs> all the licenses die on LabVIEW and I have to go around all the build servers and reactivate it all. But other than that, that bit's pretty seamless. Um, but, you know, there's, I would love to do more with it, um, like being figure out how to do some like better system testing and automating that. Um, but yeah, right now, that's felt like the limit of the investment for setup for each project kind of outweighs the benefits right now. Yeah, the big thing I want to do is I really want to start using Docker, and I'm still like at the stage where like I'm trying to justify the time. <laughs> I just I, I tried it once, and I, it was really finicky, and I couldn't quite get it to work. And I was like, eh. and I was like, well, what I have works, and so I've used it a lot in Linux projects. Um, I've not yet tried it with Windows, and tried it with LabVIEW. I've looked over what's involved, and to be honest, it's always looked, like you say, I'm just like, man, I can see me putting hours into this and not getting very far. And to be frank, this is one of those times as a, as a one-man band where it's like, I'm going to sit back, the, these guys, you know, like, like Christian uh, Butcher's done loads of work on this and has had a lot of success, I think, um, who are making good progress with this. I'm going to sit back and uh, let's see where this goes. But, I mean... Windows containers full stop have seemed like quite a different beast from from Docker. Um, I've been looking at using it on on some Rust projects as well, where I'm using Windows. And uh, actually, it's like, oh, this it might just be easier to do the old school build s server uh, for that as well. Yeah, the problem is not just getting Labby up and running, but then it's getting it registered and, and licensed, and then BIPM up and licensed, and and it's, yeah, and then. The hardware issues. I mean, like you said, I think Christian solved some of those problems. But yeah, I'm like you. I'm waiting for somebody to have like an out of the box. Like, I just clone this image and it works or something. Yeah. yeah. I download this Docker file and run it and everything's happy. So I don't know. Maybe somebody will come up with that. Biggest crust. Yeah. 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 yeah we need to all encourage Christian and buy him some beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, like I was looking the other day and I think he's got this an awful lot of the way. Like, um, I, I think he, it's, it's, uh, he's made really good progress with him with that, and there are others as well. He's just one I've seen more, most recently talking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he gave a presentation at uh, GDevCon just like you did. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that brings us back around to GCLI. So uh, I was still, uh, we got distracted. Um, so yeah, tell us like what GCLI is, what advantages it has over the built-in LabVIEW CLI. That would be one. Topic. Yeah. Well, it's um. So GCLI is basically a, a tool for allowing you to add a command line interface to a LabVIEW program. Um, LabVIEW itself does not play nice um, as a kind of relic of the fact it's a whole IDE at runtime that's that's running these VIs, so you don't get direct access um, to those things like you do in other languages. And a really big case for that is CI. So, um, or any kind of automation really is generally far easier on the command line. Um, so I got really interested in that. Um, I originally got in, looked at CI and I was trying to build a um, Jenkins plugin to talk directly to LabVIEW. That was my start. I thought, right, I'm gonna sit down and learn enough Java to be dangerous and, and build a plugin that will talk to LabVIEW. 
And I think I got some basics working, but I always saw there were some real kind of dead ends with that. And then it was around, uh, well, it must have been around 2012, 2013, because it was built in 2011. 2011. <laughs> I decided, well, okay, what if you had another program? Uh, and that I don't like tying tools together. I like having a tool that is flexible and does one thing really well. So I kind of always had a thing about building a Jenkins plugin always seemed like not a good solution because what if Jenkins goes out of fashion as somewhat has. <laughs> Um, so the right, I need a more general purpose thing. I kind of put it on the back burner for a while. And, uh, then I heard about LabVIEW and XG <laughs> and how that was only going to be extensible in, in C sharp at the time. And I thought, well, might be interesting to learn a bit of C sharp. And to be honest, that's how it started was like, I want to learn a bit of C sharp. Um, I can do command line stuff with C sharp. Let me see how I might tie these two things together. So. I kind of managed to come up with a basic system. You know, it's the really simple like TCP communications between LabVIEW and and and, and C Sharp, and that was it. Um, they and it got a bit of traction, uh, which was great fun, and you know that was really what turned it into what it is today as well. So I, I should have checked some of the GitHub names. Like there were one or two people, particularly at the early stage, who came and said, "Oh, this is how we could do the discovery instead." Because um, actually, a lot of the tricky bit is in launching LabVIEW, trying to find LabVIEW properly and kind of connecting it to, to what you're doing. And then, so this actually predated the LabVIEW one, uh, the built-in one. Um, and so NI released theirs, <laughs> to which to be frank, I probably is a like a, what's the, the phrase, competitive testing. <laughs> I probably should have played with more. Um, I never have because I kind of looked at it and said, yeah, it's okay. It's, um, it uses VI server, I think it seems to be a bit more finickety with connections and it runs a VI from start to completion, which was never what I wanted. You know, I really wanted a way to, you know, ultimately create like a fairly native feeling command line, uh, interface to, to some LabVIEW code. Whereas that just, and I think it still does just runs to completion and then reports results. Yeah, so so that's why I've kind of continued with it. Um, I had another thought, which has just dropped out of my head. There was another reason why I really pursued this route. Um, well, I remember GCLI being oh. faster than LabVIEW CLI. That was one thing, because uh, I think Stefan sent me a demo, and it was like 10 times faster. I was like, done. <laughs> oh, that's good to know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we definitely worked on kind of the launch speed. Um, we've had good input from NI, so trying to work, you know, the big problem at the start was just dialogues. You know, again, you know, a lot of the challenges with LabVIEW come from its legacy as how it's been constructed. And one of those is that it is a user interface driven, you know, IDE, you're launching an IDE for a lot of these tools. Um, so getting around a lot of dialogues has been, uh, um, eventful, but we're there. I think now pretty much the only dialogue that should block you is the um, licensing dialogue, which and I are probably going to be reluctant to do much about. Um, so I've been working on a few things like that. And then recently, I've been rewriting it in, in Rust um, for a mixture of abilities. One is just NXG died, kind of wasn't interested in, in learning much more about C Sharp. And I've been working a lot more with Rust. So it was an interesting uh, challenge from that perspective. Um, I also was doing more stuff with LabVIEW on Linux. So I, I wanted the ability to run this on Linux, which um, probably could have ported C Sharp now that there's this .NET core and multi-platform .NET. But um, kind of at that point, to be honest, the code was a bit of a mess as well. <laughs> it grown very organically. I was like, well, let's have a fresh slate. Let's go to, to Rust. We can run it cross-platform then. Um, I can play an experiment and get, get happy with Rust. Um, and that is the next version that is currently available as a beta to download. And I still need to get it on the tools network. I've not quite uh, crossed that path yet uh, as the release, but. Um, oh, uh, yeah. For the listeners, they should know, right? That if they're using LabVIEW 2022, they need to download the new beta, right? That's right. Yeah. So LabVIEW 2022. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Because of the version naming difference, it, it doesn't quite, I can't remember. I thought I'd done it the same in both, but. Maybe I'd already tested it in Rust and, and so, yeah, so that really, I really need to just get on that. 
I originally delayed it and just did it as a beta because I wanted to get the Linux support polished and then I just haven't had the time yet. Um, so I need to just get through the process to get it back on the tools network. I really need to try and take it off of NI's tools network and put it on the VIPM community one so it's a bit easier to update. Um, that feels like a big task right now is, is I've got to go through that update process with them as well. Um, but yeah, it should be cool. cool. Like I've been really pleased. It's been really stable. I think it's fixed a couple of the key stability issues that had with, um, well, it wasn't really stability issues with C-sharp, but it, some of the error reporting, the way it did error reporting was not clear what was going on. So that should be a lot clearer now. Um, I've improved the, uh, way the output works and, um, the other thing I'd hope to get into this version is actually start being able to do standard input. Um, so be able to input things into LabVIEW from the command line other than just the initial parameters. But um, yeah, that's one for another day. There's a API design aspect to that that I need to get my head around uh, as to what that would look like. But yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm really excited. And it's, it's had the desired effect for me, which was at the time I, I looked, I was looking at the CI thing. And I was saying, well, look, I haven't got the time to, to build a whole CI suite of tools, right? Because, you know, you need the interface, but you need all the, the interfaces to the, the lab you build system, to VI tester, test frameworks, whatever. So if I can crack this one piece, like this foundational piece of being able to automate lab view through the command line, and hopefully others can build on top of that. And that's been a really exciting thing to see. Um, it, it feels like that's been very successful. There's a lot of people building tools on top of it and, and it's one of those things, isn't it? They kind of say, uh, it, it feels really good with open source projects when someone comes to you that you've never heard of. <laughs> They're like, oh, I've got this change or I've been using this thing. It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> like, this has gone beyond just people who I'm able to shout at about it. <laughs> Very cool. So uh, what challenges do you find going from like having this tool that you built for yourself to making it fully open source and like publishing it and getting it out there? And did, did, did that come naturally or is that challenging? Uh, it came fairly naturally, to be honest, because I, I, it started from an open source place. Um, that was always the intention. Um, I always wanted this, like I say, to act as a foundational piece um, so that hopefully others can build on top of that in, in ways I can leverage. So um, it was always, always open source. It was a bit scary because I was new to the C Sharp side. Um, and, you know, it could well have been one of those projects that just withered on GitHub, <laughs> never to be seen. Um, but it's really paid off because, as I say, you know, I don't think it would be as good as it is now if it wasn't for some of the input that I've had from people uh, and, and ideas in, in terms of how to improve it and um, small changes. So, yeah, that's been really good. I mean, with LabVIEW, the challenge with open source is, you know, the tooling. So, you know, dealing with pull requests in LabVIEW is a pain. You can't just look on a web interface to see what's going on. You always have to, well, you know, in my case, fire up a VM, pull the version, try and compare it to what you've got. Like, um, that process is, is, is difficult with LabVIEW, um, and the distribution, right? I mean, we've, we've got VIPM. I've managed to kind of distribute it fairly nicely with VIPM. Um, my next challenge, like I say, is, is making it easier to push out updates because I mean, it's not a big task, but I, I don't know about you, like I get really enthralled in the problem and then I really struggle with those finishing pieces <laughs> once the problem's solved. And so anything I can do to reduce the fric friction of actually putting these updates out will be, uh, will yeah. be huge. You and I should yeah. talk after this because I, I do have a system for, for sending updates and stuff and maybe maybe we can collaborate a little bit and we'll have to go cool, yeah, yeah. at that. Yeah, I, that's really cool. Um, you and I had talked before about doing some open source stuff, so I, I still got that in the back of my head. I, I do feel like one of the things that we need in LabVIEW as an open source project is a better set of refactoring tools. Yeah. I feel like that could be something that would be, because if you've got the right interface, then you could just have people add on their own tools. Because there's a lot yeah, of yeah. LabVIEW that are just painful that don't need to be <laughs> around like classes and renaming and moving classes around. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like it has a very big impact because there's this, a lot of LabVIEW developers have this idea that you have to get all the class hierarchy and everything right the first time. And so it kind of puts people that like waterfall of like must design everything up front first because it's so painful to change it later. Yeah, I kind of thought around this like, it's one of the things that's always put me off the actor framework. Like I get the design, I think it's a good design. Um, but I just looked at it and just thought, 
oh, man, managing all those classes looks like a headache. <laughs> and, you know, it has scripting tools. And to be fair, it's something I want to revisit because I think the tools have got very good. And now we have interfaces in LabVIEW. Like, that seems like such a natural thing that will benefit the actor framework significantly. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it's something I need to revisit. But but exactly that, there, there's certain things that just feel really heavyweight still um, in, in LabVIEW, um, especially around, yeah, refactoring is a, is a really big one. Um, refactoring automation are two, two big ones really for me. Uh, yeah, the, ref the tools around actor framework are better, but some things are still kind of difficult. Like, for example, just the simple act of like renaming a message. Well, it's in its own folder on disk, so you got to rename the method that yeah. calls, you got to rename the folder, you got to rename the class, you got to relink everything, and all the class constants that go in and out have the name of the message, and so so there's a bunch of little steps that you have to do. And so, and I wrote a little tool to do that, but I am sure I'm not the only one, so there's probably like 20 different tools floating around out there for people who, who do that, and so it would be nice to have that all unified in one place. Yeah, there, there are certain things I was really excited about in NXG. And the new components and project layout stuff was was one of them. Um, I was very sad to see that that, that fail because I think it's a uh, yeah, it, it, like it, it's a major um, impact in LabVIEW. Is every time I'd want to do refactoring, I'm refactoring what's in the code. But yeah, refactoring the layout on disk, like um, it's just another thing that pulls you away from what you're actually trying to achieve. Yeah, I think that's it, right? Like you want to automate and make the things that you want to be able to focus on solving the customer's problem and so and they're not like the language syntax and like how do I send messages from here to there? Like that that stuff should all be like one or two clicks or as automated as possible. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, so you mentioned uh, loading Rust. I, I find that interesting. I, I feel like with the demise of NXG, a lot of LabVIEW programmers are trying to learn other languages because they're kind of like worried about what's coming going forward. I mean, I think even, I mean, I started this podcast about LabVIEW, so I'm pretty sure LabVIEW is going to stick around for a little while at least. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm curious about the future myself, but I think it's good to learn some of these languages anyway. I mean, I think it makes you a better, more well-rounded programmer, and you can pull in ideas from other languages and things. But, I mean, I see most LabVIEW programmers going one of two directions. They're either doing what you're doing and learning Rust in order to get, like, closer to the hardware... Because it's more like C, it's more low level, or they go the other way, which is what I've been doing is and learning Python, more of like a higher level, more like the data analytics side of like collecting all this data. What do we do with it now? Uh, so yeah, I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then the the other thing too is like using Linux, because I am I absolutely detest Microsoft. I would be a happy <laughs> in my life, and I I cringe every time I, I get a new customer like, yeah, we're using Windows. I'm like, so yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on all of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, f for a long time, I've kind of recognized like the the benefit of going to other languages. So, I mean, my history, LabVIEW was really my first language. We did a bit of C, C++ at uni, but I didn't get it. Like, it wasn't until I got into LabVIEW. Um, but since then, and for the longest time, you know, even pre-NXG, so like I say, you know, GCLI was almost a, a, a Java plugin for Jenkins because I did an algorithms course, which was in Java. Um, and there I learned about templating. Uh, interfaces things like that um and yeah i've done a lot of javascript done python um and yeah ultimately right now a lot of my efforts going into rust because uh i kind of recognize like for the test side of things you know labview still i think has a solid future that's that's where ni's interest is uh it's where the tool is is, is built around very much but uh, a lot of my work now is is a lot more in kind of measurement system development and product development or prototyping. And over the last few years, I've been feeling the limits of LabVIEW in that area, like being able to target ARM processes, for example, to get down to smaller hardware. Um, or the, the Linux work that I've done with LabVIEW was we had like a, I can't remember how many cores, it was 64 core like beast CPU rack um, that we wanted to utilize um, and I got Lavi running on there, but you know we didn't want to install a full. You know we don't. It, it was going um, offshore. It was very inaccessible, so it had to be something that we could trust to be reliable. So uh, you know Windows was out pretty quick then. Um, so 
Yeah, um, no, like uh, now it's time to update things. Yeah, exactly. Then it disappeared, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so that was my kind of driving force with Rust. And it was an interesting language to learn anyway, because it, it's, you know, as you say, even if you're not going to take them forward, I think doing some basic learning in a variety of different languages and understanding what these different things are, it's going to make you uh, a more well-rounded technologist anyway, because now I can look at a problem and I can say, well, actually, yeah, you know, we need Rust for this because we need the performance. Um, we can say, you know what? We can just use like a really high level garbage collector language or use LabVIEW here. Um, and it's going to be fine because this isn't the bottleneck. Um, and understanding those concepts is easiest done going around these different languages and trying them out and seeing what the, the pros and cons are. Um, and you can take those ideas back exactly as you say. So if you go back through my GitHub and some of my blog posts, I know I've got one on a, like a UI binding thing, which was me trying to replicate how some of the JavaScript frameworks work in LabVIEW. Um, I did one, actually, I really need to polish off again, really, a couple of, maybe 18 months ago, I did a, a futures library, um, which is something really that I took from, from JavaScript and Rust to some extent um, in how they can work with this concept of futures. And so all these ideas feed back into LabVIEW. Um, or whatever language you're doing. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer that once you've... All these languages are in families. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to say, okay, you learn Python and now you can write C. <laughs> but it's like, you know, once you have a rough skill in one of these languages, in, in one of these kind of families of languages, then it, moving between them is not a big deal very often. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. And saying that, I really hated the idea of C++, so that's why I waited for Rust. <laughs> so I can see too many ways to hurt yourself with C++. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talk about languages or families of languages. It's kind of like spoken language too, right? Like, I mean, like Spanish and English use the same alphabet. You try to learn Russian or Chinese, and it's like completely different. I think there's something to be said for, like, writing stuff that's idiomatic. Like, the Python community is very much about writing stuff in a Pythonic way, right? And if you're a lab you program, you inherited the code from somebody who only knew C... You know exactly what I'm talking about. You see <laughs> the structure at the beginning that initializes all the local variables and stuff, and you just like, you know, it's one of those things that like, yeah, that's not the way to do it. Like, so there's something about like trying to apply the idea of what they're doing without like the syntax per se. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is it. You know, there are all these ideas. You know flying around in these other languages that can be brought in and yeah like i said that they'll all do them in their own way based on the restrictions of that language so you know futures is a great example in in javascript because it is a single threaded um garbage collected language it, it's a fairly straightforward concept i mean originally we just did it with callbacks everywhere um and and this is kind of just some syntax over that you know rust does it totally different because it is uh, there's no garbage collector to manage memory for you. So it's got a, I mean, I don't even fully understand how it all works, but it does things in a very different way where, um, does it in what's called a lazy way. So instead of waiting for something to happen, you can say, right, I'm ready for the answer now. And that triggers it all to happen. And so, yeah, but the underlying concept is the same idea. And that's the interesting thing there is then taking that back to lab and say, well, okay, well, what does this look like for lab? View? What's interesting for lab view? So, um, you know, Simple example of the futures is, well, I want it to support the lab view style of error handling, for example, um, and making sure that's natural and easy to use. Yeah, that is one of the difference with lab view and other languages. It's definitely the way it handled it. There are no like exceptions. Yeah, yeah. One of the interesting things I played around with with other languages, I read uh, some of the unit testing books and talked a lot. And yeah, I know you've talked about this, like mocks and stubs and all that. And I tried to implement mocks in, in it was, it's actually quite hard to do in LabVIEW because like some of these dynamic languages like Python and stuff, you can do monkey patching and things like that. And it's like <laughs> stuff on the fly and like does it all for you. And in LabVIEW, like the static typing really gets in the way of yeah. doing a lot of that type of stuff. Yeah, static typing is a really interesting thing. It's, it's something I'm very keen on. Like I've done some production code in Python and in JavaScript and I hope never to again because the amount of type bugs that I hit Maybe it was inexperienced, but uh, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I, I think 
that dynamic typing is risky, but yeah, there's some really cool tricks you can play like that stuff <laughs> where it's just so simple to do. But yeah, in a static language, you know, fundam it's, it's essentially got to be scripted in some way if you, if you want it to be easy. So I made like the core library for supporting that, but I never got as far as actually making it easy to script putting those together. I think you got a bit further maybe that that didn't. Yeah, well, I think I took inspiration from what you did. I think you had sent me something that you had and I, I think I made it further, but to be honest, I, I've moved away from using mocks completely. I'm just like, it just like overcomplicates the tasks. It makes it really hard. And it's just like, I, I found just in LabVIEW, it was just too much of a pain. Yeah, there, there are some specific cases where I find it, it really is the best way. And then I'll bring out that library, but it's the exception rather than the rule for me. Like it's, it's very rare. Like, in fact, I was looking at a project the other day and, you know, I, I think across that project, I've got maybe four or 500 tests and, and maybe six of them use mocks. Like it's very much, uh, I really don't see another good way to do this bit <laughs> and I'll reach for it. So I have a question in though, like, and I've heard the complaint about Python and the loose typing a lot. I think Chris Stryker, he's like, he's like, yeah, you, you call this Python function, but the output depends on what you pass into it. It's not all these obvious what it outputs and, and things like that. Do, do things like type hints in Python and maybe like TypeScript and JavaScript, do they alleviate a lot of those problems or, or how does that? Yeah, so Python, the type hints, so that's what I ended up doing on, on the project I did in Python. I did a web backend in it and um, I was quite new to Python, but the customer were very comfortable with it and I was kind of happy I could get what I needed going with it. Um, and I did the type hints. The problem with the type hints in yeah, I can't quite remember that. Certainly with TypeScript and JavaScript, it's still possible to break it, but it's a lot better. And certainly TypeScript... Is, well, the, sort of, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, for those of you, don't, if you don't know, TypeScript is like a, a layer on top of JavaScript that adds the types and then um, transpiles out to JavaScript. The, um, but TypeScript, it checks stuff at... On time does it or is it or is it an edit time thing? No, so that's the problem with TypeScript because especially in the web, you have a load of stuff coming in and out that's unchecked. So you can kind of make sure internally, uh, this was my experience. So I've done one project with TypeScript to try and get over some of these issues. And uh, this was the one problem I had with it is it works as long as the data comes in right, <laughs> but it doesn't do any validation on the data when it comes in. Um, other than that, though, yeah, it will basically force you to, it, it will cause compile errors once it's in, but you, you have a lot of, because um, essentially the boundary in and out is still often JSON or something like that. It doesn't really validate that. Um, I th think there's libraries for doing that, but I, I didn't get that. Yeah. In Python, the type hints, you basically is just when you pass a parameter into a function, you say, I expect this to be an integer or whatever, and then... And the, like you tell it what it's supposed to output. And then there's some checker that you run that like scans your Python file and says, yes, you're obeying all this stuff you're supposed to be or not. But, but yeah, like at runtime, like I don't know what happens at runtime or if it just like, yeah. Yeah. I suspect it's probably similar. Cause I think I, I remember coming away from using those thinking this is a start, but it's not quite as strong as I'd like. <laughs> um, I mean, it's still great. I mean, obviously from documentation point of view as well, you know, like you were saying with, uh, was it was a Chris Stryker, you were saying, saying, how do I know what to put into it? Like, it's a great thing just to have for documentation. I, I think the dynamically typed stuff is great for, you know, scripting and experimenting. But I think at some point when you need a certain level of trust in the software, you need something to say, this is expecting a string and I'm not giving it a number <laughs> or, um, you know, things like that that are so easy to do. Um, and changes, refactoring, right? An awful lot of stuff I try and do is is around kind of that fearless refactoring because that's how your software generally improves. And so if you can't be sure, well, if I change this and assume it's a number instead of a string, everything's going to break that needs that to be a... And, and I, I want that certainty. Um, that is one advantage that LabVIEW has in refactoring, I will say, is that you can, like, you know, if you're going to change, like, the type of an input or something, you can change it and then just see everywhere that breaks. And you're like, yeah. hey, I mean, it doesn't always work, right? Like, you have to be, it actually has to be in the project. And you can't be calling stuff dynamically. But, yeah, th that's definitely a really useful tool. Uh, Steven Mercer, I think, put me onto that. He's like, yeah, I just use that as my, like, refactoring list. Like, you know, here's all the things and just check them off as I go. 
Yeah, I mean that that's it. That that's what you want to know, you know, because ultimately your interface is a contract, right? It either exists on paper, exists in the code, or it exists in your head. <laughs> it's probably not on paper in most cases. <laughs> so if it's not in the code, I kind of think of that as yeah. as not being very useful. Well, sometimes the paper can be misleading because when yeah. you, change, you yeah. get to change the documentation, that definitely happens. Even the most well intentioned I mean, people. So. This is one of the things I've been really excited about with Rust is some of the tooling around that stuff so good is like you can just generate the documentation from the code and and so that, then you don't run into that issue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Have you used Antidoc yet? That is uh, one of my new favorite tools. Yeah, I, I haven't used it yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been using ASCII doc for a while though for like user documentation. So I'm kind of familiar with that side. But yeah, I haven't played yet with... Uh, um, all of what that can do. That That's one of the things on my list. <laughs> but the ASCII doc thing, were you using Olivier's toolkit or are you just like writing your own? No, just writing it. So I, for, I realized I kept missing user documentation um, when I used to keep it separately. So I started putting it in the repository as ASCII doc. And it is literally, it's, I'm not going to say I always follow this perfectly because it's still a manual process. You know, I have a checklist when I finish a feature one of those things is, have you put the feature in the documentation? <laughs> um, so I do it there in the repo. It gets tagged with an update. And again, that comes to you know having something that's always ready to go. So if I do a build, it'll build the documentation as well, which if I've remembered, will, will be in sync with the code. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of trying to keep all the documentation and any requirements, documents, anything like that, that you have in the repository because like otherwise they get out of sync. If you have like a separate wiki or something where you're tracking things, it's really easy. I mean... I feel like for issue tracking, okay, yeah, you, you're almost, almost everybody uses some separate thing for issue tracking, but yeah. Yeah, I, I've kind of slowly come around to the idea that essentially um, if it's something developer needs to be keeping on top of, it probably needs to go to the repo. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, issue tracking is a bit different because it's it's so, um, it, it's sort of ephemeral, you know, yeah. Once you're done with an issue, you kind of want it recorded for history, but it's not like a living continuous thing. Um, but yeah, anything like that. Also, I'm really commits with the issue number that kind of helps tie those together a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really good habit to get into. I, I try to do that, and then I forget. I've been <laughs> writing like little I uh, get hooks to like force myself to do it because I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing I'm really interested. In, I don't know if you've come across this. Actually, I haven't seen anyone in the lab who will talk much about it is um decision records so architectural decision records as a uh, also part of the repo where you document the decision the the essential but well, architectural decisions as the name suggests in my head is essentially anything that isn't obvious in the code why it's been done that way <laughs> or something that you know exists above the code um so that's a really interesting idea in that route but i i have a folder for it <laughs> i'm not going to say that i do it very often yeah, I have heard people talk about that, but not in the LabV community. A lot of other communities are really big on talking about that. So that is something that we should probably... That, there's like blog posts and stuff out there, right? About like specific ways that people point out them and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot out there on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's obviously totally language agnostic as well. So uh, it will all apply to LabV as it does anything. There's a lot of little weird, interesting little standards out there that you can adopt, like uh, the commit notation stuff, like Arlo's commit notation. I don't know. I looked at it. I never actually used it, but uh, I know some people are really big on that. Is that the one where you can like generate uh, change logs from it? Or is that yeah, Felipe, I think, had, had a thing where he did that. But basically, like every every commit, it's like I'm adding a feature, I'm, refa I'm fixing a bug, and I'm refactoring, like it put like a letter or something at the beginning, and then... And then you do something about like, is it tested or not? Or is it broken? And like, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I guess the point being that then you can parse the, parse the yeah. get easier and come out with more meaningful information. Yeah. I mean, it's the only way I can imagine managing stuff like that at scale. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think it's, I still feel like some of that, I mean, I've seen it in, in response to like trying to automate versioning. So like if it's a breaking change or not. But I still think some of that's a bit too subtle to automate. Um, but yeah, definitely. Like right now, I I do, as I go, I try and put change, a change log in a document in the repo as well um, with 
some of that in mind in the future, like I could automate it out of that, get it out of the, the, the get messages as well. Yeah. Yeah, I try to just, uh, like when I make a release, I just go look back through all the Git stuff and I just manually like have a text file I update and I think it just gets built into it. Um, the pro- yeah, the oh, irony is I know I had, had a big long change log, so I just like kept up with it, but I, yeah. Yeah, the irony is I probably end up doing that as well anyway because I don't trust whether I remembered to actually do put all the changes in. But <laughs> Yeah, well, if I was smart, I would have something where I just kept the change log and then my uh, script when I build stuff would just pull the most recent stuff out of there, but I just didn't bother. I basically just duplicate it. I'm like, hey, here's the tech file with the release notes for this version and then I add the same thing to that change log. Yeah. Oh. Like some level of manual process, I feel like if it do- if it do- if it's like quick and easy and it doesn't take much, it's like, it moves down on the list of things to do pretty quickly. Yeah, that's it. You know, that that's the thing I really struggle with is just time. And so it's yeah, that's it. If it's if it's easy and obvious and, and less prone to error. Yeah, I was gonna say not too error prone, exactly that then. You know, I I given enough time in the world, yeah, I'd be working on automating so much more of this. But uh right now that's that's slow down my list of priorities. It's the XKCD comic about how much time you save versus how much time you can invest in, in doing the improvement. Yeah, yeah. And I heard another good one. I think it was from Charity Majors. I think she put a number on it. It's like, if you want to go changing stuff, like changing tools or something like that, you, I can't remember the number she put on it, but let's say, you want to assume that it's going to give you at least a 2x speed up because there's so much overhead in that change. And she may have even said 10x, I can't remember. Um, but the point kind of stands like there is a cost to yeah. either automating these things or changing tools that you have to, you know, that that's got to be part of the judgment call on, on where to spend your time. Yeah. Well, also, if it's a manual process and all you're doing is following a little procedure, it's much easier to change the procedure than to change the automated tooling sometimes. Yeah. Like, I mean, if it's just tweaking, maybe it's okay. But if you're making major changes, it's much easier to, to change the the process document than the, the big ones. Yeah. Like this is something I, I can't remember. There's there's a good maxim for it, and I can't remember how to put it in a in a succinct way. But like before you automate anything, you should be doing it manually, because exactly that. Once you've automated it, you're probably not going to change it. You want to be kind of doing it manually, figuring out the kinks, figuring out the the, the problems that could occur before you um, automate it. I, I should think the maxim is garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, or as my dad used to say about power tools. He's a he's a builder and he's never been a big fan of them. He's always like things just go fast so much quicker <laughs> with a power tool than a hand tool. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, I mean the power tools can cause problems, right? Like you're cutting something and you get a big powerful saw. It's easy to overcut, or like uh, you know you're putting in a screw with a with a power screwdriver. It's easy to over torque it and strip it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that they're not worthwhile and they're not good, but first you want to learn. Yeah. You want to over talk here by hand and go, oh, okay, I see. If I drive this too hard, it's going <laughs> to rip the head of the screw out. This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment podcast is brought to you by Backups. When was the last time you backed up all of your data? It's been too long, hasn't it? You freaking out a little bit? Should you maybe go do a little backup? Well, after the podcast anyways. Oh, one thing I did want to go back to, though, when you were talking about Rust, do you have any resources for learning Rust? Yeah, so the the community has like loads of um, really good documentation. So I mostly went through there's something called the Rust book, which is kind of like a, a kind of guidebook that takes you through things. Um, but there's also I've never tried it. There's something called Rustlings, which I think is like a more interactive command line thing um, that you can go through and set your challenges. Um, and then yeah, really it's. For me, learning these languages has always been about trying to find a small enough problem that you're not going to get too lost in it, um, and you can just get started on something, and, and that's really where I, I, I tend to find these out. Um, what else did I do? I'm sure I must have... I think that was about it, and you know, I stepped into it very slowly, so actually the first thing I did was um, a simulator, so I was like, I'm interested in this thing, I can't risk customer code on this yet, um, but we've got this networked instrument that is too expensive for me to have one, so I'm going to write a little simulator in Rust Max like that. And so finding little non-critical pieces of work, but I struggle unless it's like a real problem I've got to solve. I've always struggled with, with getting into kind of 
more contrived uh, challenges. So like that's really helped me. So that's kind of where I started. Like, well, I'm going to do this little simulator in Rust or then I had another project where I was like, well, we're doing a lot of processing in C because we have to get down to like high performance computing libraries and stuff. But um, I'm going to write, rewrite some of this in Rust just so I can compare the two and understand the differences. So um, that was kind of the route I took. But yeah, if you, the Rust book and the Rustlings resources kind of where I went. Uh, but there's, there's there's a lot out there. Like it's a really good community that really working hard to be uh, easy for beginners to get into. Uh, so yeah, it probably won't fall short <laughs> having a good hunt around. Yeah. yeah. So, so what's the biggest difference you found between Rust and Levy? Like what was the biggest adjustment? So memory management, basically. <laughs> With Rust, you have to care about it again. Um, like LabVIEW is an, a magic tool in in certain ways and the amount of performance you can get out of it without having to worry about m memory is amazing like this project where we had to go to C we did end up having to go to C but we got a long way in LabVIEW before we finally had to hand up put our hands up and say we just don't have enough control here um, in Rust you obviously have a lot of control over the memory, which can be a positive thing, but it adds certain amount of complexity. And I mean, Rust, I think, is way better than C or C++ for this. But, you know, for each item, it's like, okay, do I need a layer of management around this? So, uh, you know, whereas C is kind of known for, for working with a lot of raw pointers, they're ultimately very dangerous there. <laughs> um, very easy to cause bugs. So Rust makes that difficult, but as part of that, you have to look at it and say, okay, am I using this variable across threads? So I need to use a thread safe method or am I using it in one thread? Um, do I, uh, do you have multiple people being able to change this? Because one of the things that the kind of unique thing that Rust brings, which is interesting, like LabVIEW almost has this inherently built into the data flow is a variable is either mutable or not. Um, and only one thing can have the capability of changing a variable at a time. One thing being like one function. Essentially, once you create a reference to that variable that's mutable, nothing else can have a reference to that variable. Ah, so it prevents like parallel race condition stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting how you kind of look at lab, you go, Ha, huh, that's why LabVIEW works. Because <laughs> it, it really prevents some of those cases. So, um, yeah, that, that's been the biggest adjustment. And I, I still struggle in text-based languages to picture the architecture. But I think that's coming with practice. Um, you know, on LabVIEW, the architecture is there in front. <laughs> like, I can see the loops and see what's connected by a queue or not. Um, with With... I mean, all text-based languages, it's taken me a little while to get my head around, okay, what does an architecture look like in this? Um, uh, in reality, it's still very much in my head, but I've started to, to kind of find my equivalents and, and what that looks like. Yeah, the one problem I've had with Python is like doing stuff with launching asynchronous processes and queues and stuff It is exactly what you said. Like, it's hard to visually see what's running in parallel. Yeah. Because in LabVIEW, it's like super obvious. Once you figure out the data flow thing, you're like, okay, you know, there's two loops, there's nothing between them. Hey, they're running in parallel. That's easy. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very different experience when it comes to parallel programming. Um, but it is a lot easier. You know, I, I think back when I was at NI, it was like parallel programming, text-based languages, if you dare. <laughs> um, with Rust, certainly like it, it feels a bit less scary now than, you know, that's one of the reasons I've waited for this. You know, I've kind of known for a while that C++ would probably be a good language for me from an application point of view, but I just didn't want to open that kind of worms <laughs> in terms of learning how to do things like that safely. It seems like a lot of the text-based languages are getting better at doing parallel programming. Like there's the async and await stuff in Python, which I haven't actually used, but I hear that's a much easier way of doing the concurrent programming. Yeah. I mean, that stuff's really... Interesting is a totally different model from the way you do stuff in 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 LabVIEW and in yeah kind of traditional text-based languages. Um, it's kind of that thing that obviously works because it's been added to about every language in the past five or ten years that that wants to keep up to date. Um, so I, I mean they have it in C sharp now I think they have it in. It's kind of how 
JavaScript and Node.js always worked, albeit in a not very pretty way, which is this idea of, well, I have multiple tasks running, but they can just run the next thing when they're done. So, um, because especially in networked applications, a lot of, a lot of your time is spent waiting for something, not doing something. <laughs> Um, and that's where that kind of model works. It, it took me a long time to figure out how JavaScript could possibly do con do things concurrently, <laughs> not in parallel, but concurrently when it was single threaded. And that's basically it. It's like, well, if you assume most of the time you're just waiting for a response anyway, you can do other things while you're waiting. Um, uh, so yeah, that that's kind of like a whole different model, but it has a lot of parallels pardon the pun, with how stuff like Actor Framework works. You know, it's, it's not message-based necessarily, but it has that same feel of you go off and do what you need to do over there and tell me when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, it, it's, it's a really powerful way. So it still looks sequential. You can still reason about it sequentially. I think that's the power of it. But you can still leverage, you know, multi-core processing. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, I need to play around with that more. Yeah, it's it's cool. It, it's um, I think kind of if I've done it in 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 Python, I'd pick up a bit of JavaScript if you really want to kind of see the kind of golden implementation of that. If you like, I'm not saying it is the best implementation, but I say that they've been doing it for a lot longer than a lot of these other languages. So um, it's you know every, everything is done like that. So speaking of that doing stuff parallel versus synchronously. Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately, and you and I have had some conversations about uh, different ways of working and, and, and doing stuff in parallel and and doing stuff synchronously, and, and I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been hearing um, uh, yeah, some of the other episodes talking about paired programming and mob programming, and um, you know that's a super interesting one. I think... Uh, and then I, I guess you're also referring to things like Gitflow and trunk-based development and, and you know, I, everything I say has to come with a slight pinch of salt that I work alone, <laughs> mostly. Um, so I haven't got the kind of on the ground, oh, no, it's all gone wrong experience. But, um, you know, when I've kind of studied these different methods and different variations ultimately it seems to be about picking your flavor of communication more than anything. um you know if you look at kind of git flow sort of has its origins almost well maybe not origins but in the kind of pull request model of open source which was you know that exists for open source for a reason which is you've got a lot of multiple untrusted developers with very loose communication uh, spread all over the world and so the pull request model nicely kind of gates the communication for that. Here's where the communication happens. Here's how we control what goes in and what, what doesn't go in um, in an easy way versus, you know, something like trunk-based development. You have to think differently about how you gate and trust that code. So, you know, the kind of continuous delivery model really requires that, that kind of trunk-based development, which means everyone's checking in onto the, the, the main branch. And, you know, effectively what that, I mean, you might have other gates along the way, but effectively what that means is anyone can push to production. Um, so now you have to say, well, how do you trust what you're pushing to production? So you have to trust the developers to work, you know, um, you have to trust all developers and say, we're just going to let you go for it. <laughs> you have to have a lot of automated testing in order to trust what they've done. And so that's yeah. one part of that. Um, and I see pair programming as the other part of that. To me, pair programming um, strikes me as, as well as a good way for people to learn. It's an alternative to code reviews. It says you can do trunk-based development because if you do it with pair programming, the code's already been reviewed before it goes in. Whereas if you've got more of a pull request model, someone's been working alone, we want another pair of eyes on that code, you know, for the same things as you want pair programming, for checking over for, for, for bugs, for having someone else learning how that code works before it goes into the product. Um, and so I think these, 
you can have a lot of technical discussions over difficulties of merging and stuff like that. And that's definitely a factor. <laughs> and, you know, you have to, I've heard you talk in the other episodes about, you know, you have to design for that and, and consider that in the design. Um, but a lot of this is really about if we want all the code ends up with a customer to have been, you know, vetted in some way to be trustworthy, what's that kind of path to doing that? And I kind of see these as, as alternate models of, of that. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's technical and it's processed and it's people all mixed into one. <laughs> yeah, the the one issue I see with the pull request model is just like the, I'm very much about trying to get quick feedback and the pull request model seems like, I mean, part of it is having the, I don't know what the right word is, the discipline to keep your branches really short and do often pull requests. But then at some point, if you do too many, then then there's too much overhead associated with the pull requests and like interrupting other people. But when it comes to the speed of feedback, if somebody's been working on something for like an entire day, and then at the end of the day, you give them feedback and say, yeah, you're on the roll and track all day. Now you've lost an entire day's worth of work and they've got to go back and redo it, right? And, and there's right. pressure from the business to say, no, we don't want to redo that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, it's it's ugly code, it's horrible, but hey, you know, it passes this one test, so therefore we're good to go. And you're like, no, that's not the right way to do it. And so that <laughs> I feel like it creates this artificial tension. That that's exactly that, and, and this is where it's. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I think the 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 flip side to that though though is. To solve that, that person who's being in, like you say, you know, you can think of it almost as a, it's a continuum from like a pull request a day to a pull request an hour to, you know, pair programming is like a pull request a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's how much you can serve to interrupt that other person to review it. And I, and I think that's kind of the um, interesting dynamic with it is you, you want the faster feedback, but if that feedback is coming from someone, it's you have to have communication for that feedback. And so, um, you know, pull requests would have the advantage for that, if someone being able to batch that feedback in terms of providing it. <laughs> but as you say, that means you've got to wait for it. And, uh, you know, I still haven't fully got my head around it, but once you start getting into this, if you listen to, I think you've referred to like the Phoenix Project book before, yep. and this isn't actually what it's called, is it, I forget. There, there's, but, uh, <laughs> there's, the, there's the Unicorn Project, I think, and the Phoenix Project. Oh, it is actually the name of the book. Okay, yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah, like you get into actually this operates like a, a flowing queue and there's there's actually maths and dynamics to how this all works depending on, on the way you go. Um, and it's going to depend a lot on your team structure. So, you know, if you've got a team of four, um, you know, senior or, you know, very trustworthy developers, who perhaps all sit next to each other anyway. So if they're going to get blocked on something or they aren't sure about something, they can just say, hey, just look at this quickly, then you probably don't need that pull request flow as much. But if you've got a bunch of junior developers who are still learning, uh, or maybe, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of experience with the remote thing, but that's definitely a factor in this, right? Is uh, maybe they're remote, so they're not in such continuous contact with other people on the team, then you need still have some way of validating what's going on um i think that's all factors in you know i think and that's why this is a really interesting problem that people like <laughs> i suspect because there's so many factors it's like about team organization it's about code organization it's about process flow and actually you can't really take one of these things in isolation it's like the classic pitfall of agile adoption is oh okay well we're just going to do these couple of bits because they seem a bit easier yeah, yeah, but that doesn't work without the rest of the system. <laughs> um, well, that brings me to another interesting thought that I've had lately, and the pull requests and the way we do them is actually in tension with the way that we compensate people. Because if you're compensated for your individual performance, right, and you're compensated on how many Jira tickets you get done in a week or, or whatever your time box is, and now somebody's interrupting you to go review their code, right, What's your incentive to actually take the time to do a good review on that code? Because if you do a good review and you take a bunch of time, you're now you're falling behind, right? So the incentive is for you to just like quickly approve it and just be like, yep, go. Yeah, that's not but, really what you want. There's some interesting dynamics with that, and I can't say I've looked into it a lot, but I've I've heard references on on other podcasts and things to 
Um, this is something that I think a lot of people are putting a lot of thought into what that should look like. Um, you know, and in reality, it isn't a one size fits all. You know, I was listening to the other day from a company who, you know, their goal is essentially to put pull requests through an automated step first and say, you know what, this is small enough. Like, or we can see this is just a documentation change, or this is like a few lines in one function that we can just let this go without review versus, oh, this is a bit more involved, but we can check these things first and make sure we're not yeah, disturbing an engineer to review this when there's obvious like, oh, you've gone off by one bug or something that can be checked. You know, this comes back to the tooling, right? You, If you've got the capability to already put that code through a basic, you know, linter like VI analyzer, well, ideally one that can fix things as well, <laughs> uh, put it through a code formatter. <laughs> um, and this is one of the reasons I like Rust as well. This all exists is like a linter, a code formatter. So by the time you uh, actually commit this code, if it's gone through automated tests as well, then, you know, the layout's pretty consistent. Real obvious bugs shouldn't be there. It's passing tests, so the basic functionality should be there. Then the reviewer can really just focus on the bits that humans are better at, which is what are the, I guess in my mind, you know, what are the corner cases? How does this fit into the broader design? Does this make sense for what the customer is actually asking for? Um, I think if you're interrupting an engineer, yeah, 20 times a day, but like I've changed a bit of documentation, then like you say, that that's, I mean, this compensation things and quite frankly they're going to get pretty bored pretty quick as well i imagine yeah so uh that reminds me of something interesting if you play around with python in black which is like an auto formatter do you see a place for that in lab view and like because because i could totally because like for example like one of the things like you you have a vi and you change like what case structure is visible in a case structure and that gets marked as a change now <laughs> right and so when you pull up the diff tool, it shows it as a change. It's just noise because nobody really can't like 90% of the time. I don't care which case is showing unless it's like an example or something. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have block diagram cleanup, right? <laughs> well, then, yeah, that's kind of the thing. Like, how do you do it without editing up in the block diagram cleanup thing where it just looks ugly and like nobody's happy with it? And I mean, the conclusion I came to with lab view and style is part of the problem is it's fundamentally a 2D issue rather than a 1D issue as it is with text. So it's immediately more complicated and you're immediately going to get more um, variation uh, opinions <laughs> on it. Um, there's a lot more factors to style in LabVIEW because we have, you know, you don't just have a VI name, but you have an icon to consider, uh, you know, in terms of naming and, and display and you know, every data site has you have to pick a color if it's you know, working with, you know, classes. Um, and then you have the kind of different LabVIEW programming styles, which fundamentally, well, maybe not fundamentally, but they kind of drive you to different layout. You know, if you're using functional global variables versus a lot of classes, um, they might lay out differently. So I, I think it is a much more complicated problem in LabVIEW um, that is harder to automate. You know, it might be interesting to really sit down one day with the, the block diagram cleanup tool and like, really tweak, try and tweak the variables and say, how close can I get to something? Because, you know, part of this is compromise. Again, it's easier in text, I think, but there's still things in these auto layout tools in text that people will disagree on, right? I mean, classic tabs versus spaces, um, you know, how long a line should be of text and things like that. that there's always going to be some disagreement. But it's like, but can we get it to a pretty decent place where people can accept, even if it's not how I would do it by hand? The fact it can be done automatically and consistently outweighs yeah. my the, desire to have it different. <laughs> the consistent thing I think is what what I like about black because you give it a file and it always formats it the same way, so it always looks the same. So yeah. that therefore, then because if it formats it and it like stylistically it's the same, but like it orders lines differently, you know, like you know, for example, if you got like ten imports and it just randomly puts them in any order mm -hmm. as opposed to like always alphabetically. Because that then it just makes it so much easier because it cuts down on the noise when you run diffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just don't have to think about it. Like, I, I just have VS Code now set up to run the formatter when you save a file. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, I don't... It, I mean, obviously, I, I, I write it in a certain way, um, but I don't have to think about formatting the layout, really. Yeah, well, also, it kind of trains you. Eventually, you're, you're used to what it looks like, so you just automatically start putting the extra spaces anyway rather than, like, leaving them out and letting the formatter do it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Habit. But it's a really interesting question. It's one I don't have an answer to yet, but one I've been aware of as I've been looking at more text-based code is trying to get more of a sense as I get better at it of, is this the same? With LabVIEW, I can open someone else's code and really feel the difference. It's like, well, is this just the same as in text-based anyway? Or is it is it something that's a little bit more unique to LabVIEW? And I, I suspect it's a little bit more unique. It's not. Black and white, but it's a freedom in live view, I guess, to express your individuality. Yeah, <laughs> with multiple dimensions. So, yeah, but that, that's it. I mean, fundamentally, a lot of the challenges in live view come down to the fact that we are working with, with multiple dimensions, <laughs> um, and it, it makes writing these tools much harder. You know, um, combined with a smaller community, I think that's one of the reasons why it tends to be behind um, the, the wider programming community in terms of tooling. Okay, great. Uh, we're coming up on time, but there is one question I want to ask. And uh, so, right, the point, of, the name of the podcast is Live View Experiment. And so the idea is to try to encourage people to experiment and, and kind of view failure, not as like, oh, I did this thing and it didn't work out how I thought, but more like, hey, I learned something. So, uh, and you may have already mentioned it. I, I think we had talked about this a little bit before, but can you kind of dive into that question a little bit? Like something that you did that didn't turn out the way you thought and what you learned? Yeah. Do, do you know, there's quite a lot where I regret not doing it in the first place. <laughs> I have a really good example for this. This is a bit of a, 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 a silly one. There, there are more practical examples, but I think in about 2011, I heard about this thing called Bitcoin. And I was going to do a minor on FPG, Lab FPJ. <laughs> I still kick myself to this day for not having a good go at that. <laughs> that might be worth something now. But, um, you know, I, th I think the most obvious case for me is... is um, Actually, yeah, we have touched on a few like GCLI or the original Kai Jenkins plugin, you know, was something that I just, uh, it felt good to do it, throw it away. And, and, you know, it really informed that view that I have of viewing these ecosystems as uh, connected, flexible tools gets you so much further than, you know, if I'd have built that thing in Jenkins now, then I would still be forced into using Jenkins and Jenkins isn't a bad tool, but you know, there are benefits from other tools like GitLab where it's a bit more integrated with everything. Um, uh, and you know, I've had experiments with other languages and, and had to rewrite things where, um, you know, a lot of my learning at the minute has been around kind of broad programming concepts. So like doing that, that web service in Python, um, <laughs> I, it works. It you know it, it actually is in production and it, and it's been fine and and, and fairly stable. Um, but I learned a lot on that project about a Python and yeah my kind of desire for strict typing and 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 the protection that that gives me. Um, I actually learned a lot on that project as well. We we it's, it was a data science project and it's one of the first times. It's kind of hard in LabVIEW to get carried away with the latest shiny thing because it doesn't normally get supported by LabVIEW for quite a while. <laughs> um, that was one where I was working with data scientists. They're like, we, we've got to use Cassandra. Like the, the scale that this project's going to get to, we, we need Cassandra, which is like, a, um, get the right phrase, but it's a NoSQL database that can be distributed over multiple servers. And the headaches we had getting that going and we never hit the scale that it needed. <laughs> uh, it, we might still one day, but we'd have got a lot further, a lot faster. The project was saying, that's great. I'm going to start with Postgres. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll word that out. Um, and a lot of these things come back to design for me, you know, and, and that's a great example of what you've got to do there is say, well, okay, great. I've got to lean on my design tools, to make it so we can start Postgres and we know we can make that change later instead of worrying about being stuck to what we're working on now. Um, that's kind of another topic altogether, but. <laughs> no, well, that's why I think, uh, so you know, a couple of things. One, I, the most recent thing you sound like, I think that making refactoring easier, making people more comfortable with refactoring, I think leads to better design because you don't feel like you have to get it right the first time. You can experiment and try things. And then the other thing you hit on a little bit earlier is the idea of throwing things away when they don't work. I feel like sometimes we're so afraid to throw things away and start over. And, and, and part of that goes back to the whole rewrite, refactor thing. But like sometimes if you're experiment, particularly if it's a small experiment and it doesn't work out, like don't keep, tr don't keep that code around and keep trying to fix it. Just throw it away yeah. and go do something else. Yeah. And something I'm trying to do in my business now is 
actually defining those experiments separately from development. So actually going to a customer and saying, okay, great, we want this to work. And actually the warning sign is, I can't tell you how long it's going to take because I don't know how this is going to work. So instead, we're going to do an experiment or a technical spike. At the end of it, we're going to end up with knowledge, not necessarily code. Yeah. Hopefully there might be something we can, we can use or, but at the end of it, we're just going to know how this thing should work. And then we'll put it into the project in a low risk way. Once we have a better understanding of it, um, because yeah, sometimes you've got to throw things away and, and a lot of the time it's, it's refactoring things away as well. And, and it's, you know, so much I can talk about once I get started, you know, so excited for interfaces in LabVIEW because although you could do this with classes before, it's a much more natural way to say, right, here is my boundary and I'm going to swap whatever the hell I want behind this as we go. And I will refactor that bit fearlessly knowing that I'm not going to break uh, the rest of the code. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good thought. Uh, it's a really great uh, discussion. Like you said, I could go on with this forever, but I think we've hit probably close to an hour now, so we should probably uh, <laughs> call it a day. And uh, maybe we'll have to do this again in a few months or next year or something. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Would you like to sponsor an episode of the LabVIEW Experiment podcast? Drop us a line at hello at thelabviewexperiment.com.